The Lord will restore and recreate the land if they repent, that crops will abound, that uh, they will give their full yield, that rain will fall on the land once again. And just like the locusts look to judgment, this restoration of the land looks forward to a greater restoration, to a greater time of recreation, a time when God will pour out his spirit in greater fullness than ever before, a time when all God's people will be prophets, a time when salvation and security can be found by calling upon the name of the Lord. This, uh, this uh, prophecy uh, we can, of Joel, we can now fast forward a number of centuries to the time uh, that we're considering here in Acts chapter 2, as Peter stands before the crowds on the day of Pentecost. Christ has, uh, this is kind of how the book of Acts begins, right? As Christ has finished his work, uh, he's been resurrected, he ascends to heaven at the beginning of the book, right? And he doesn't do that, though, before promising to send his disciples the Holy Spirit, before promising to empower them to bear witness to the ends of the earth, right? You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, he says. And 10 days later, 10 days after this, the apostles and about 120 other disciples are gathered on the day of Pentecost. So this was the second of uh, three important pilgrimage festivals in the Israelite calendar, right? Every year there are three festivals that you're required to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to come to the temple uh, wherever you lived in the land, right? The first is Passover. The second is this, is Pentecost or the Fe- Feast of Weeks, and then, uh, which, is, which is seven weeks after Passover. And then uh, in the fall, there's the Feast of Booths. Right? So this is the second of those festivals. And the, all these disciples are gathered together on the uh, Feast of Weeks on Pentecost. And this is when that promise of Christ to empower his people with the Holy Spirit comes true, right? And in kind of an ultimate way, as the Spirit comes on this day with the sound of wind and tongues of fire, and the disciples begin to proclaim the gospel of Jesus in other languages, right, in the temple courts, they begin, to pro, they begin to proclaim the gospel. And some people, right, and this is what Peter is responding to at the very beginning of his sermon, some people say, oh, you're drunk, right? And Peter says, no, it's only nine in the morning, right? We're not drunk. This is actually, uh, this is actually something very different that's going on, right? And so the people uh, who are, um, there are some who are mockers and claim that they're drunk, but there are others, right, who who are amazed actually by what's going on, who recognize that this is something unique, that this isn't just a bunch of crazy people running around, that actually this is something quite incredible that's going on. And so they ask a question. They say, what does this mean? And this is what sparks Peter's sermon, to explain what this means, what the pouring out of the Spirit means. And so he stands up, he calls the crowd to attention, right? He answers those who were claiming they were drunk. It's only nine in the morning. Right? And he also answers those who asked what this means. And the answer he gives them is most basically what you're witnessing on this day is what Joel prophesied all those years ago about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. You're witnessing the fulfillment of this prophecy. Right? This is that, Peter says. Right? This, what you're seeing today, is that, what Joel uh, prophesied about all those centuries ago. This is the pouring out of the Spirit about which Joel prophesied. And so Peter quotes Joel's prophecy to explain what's going on and to answer what the pouring out of the Spirit means. What does it mean now that the Spirit is poured out in a more full way than ever before? What does that mean uh, for both uh, those who trust in Christ and not, for both Christians and non-Christians alike? Peter tells them what this means. And he says it especially means three things. First, it means that the last days have come. Right? The pouring out of the Spirit means that the last days have come. Second, the pouring out of the Spirit means that all God's people are prophets. All God's people are prophets because the Spirit has been poured out. And third, the Spirit's pouring out means that everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus Christ will be saved. So first we'll consider that the pouring out of the Spirit means that the last days have come. And this is uh, the beginning of Joel's prophecy where he says, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. 
The Spirit's coming means the last days have come. These two things are, are uh, conjoined in Joel's prophecy. These two things appear at the same time. When the Spirit is poured out, the last days have come. And this was a prophetic expectation, not only in Joel, but throughout all of the uh, Old Covenant prophets. The prophets spoke about the last days. They spoke about these last days as days of restoration, as days of renewal for Israel, as days of greater blessing than ever before, as days of judgment on Israel's enemies. These are the days that Joel is prophesying about. In Joel chapter 3, uh, Joel talks about the uh, restoration of Judah and of Jerusalem. And Joel is prophesying like Zechariah. He's prophesying after the exile, after the return. He's even later than Zechariah. And, uh, and he's, you know, obviously, as we've been considering, this is not a time that lives up in any way, shape, or form to the same kind of glory of the days of David and Solomon that everyone looks, for, looks back to with such fondness, right? These are days of less glory that the, that the uh, people after the exile are living in, these times when uh, prophets like Zechariah and Joel are prophesying. Um, and, and Joel talks about a restoration of Judah and of Jerusalem in chapter 3, but he points the people to an even greater glory, an even greater restoration than the days of David and of Solomon. And the last days bring with them the day of the Lord. This is what Joel talks about too in chapter 3, a day of the destruction of the wicked, but where the righteous will dwell with God forever. And there are signs which precede this last day, right? This is what Joel says in this prophecy, that there are signs which will come. You'll know it's the last days because there are these signs that come. So look at verses 19 and 20. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. So these signs, the fact that these signs have come means that the day of the Lord is imminent. These are signs of God coming as a judge of the righteous and of the wicked. These are signs of the day of the Lord. And Peter says that this prophecy is fulfilled at Pentecost. Some commentators uh, look at this passage and say that, well, part of this has been fulfilled at Pentecost, right? The pouring out of the Spirit, but we're still waiting for part of it to be fulfilled in the future, right? We're still waiting for the signs because, you know, in many ways, these signs are things that, uh, things that are incredible and that we didn't exactly, you know, we don't exactly read about seeing you know, seeing things exactly like what's being described. And so some would say, well, we're still waiting for these signs to come. But if you look just one verse below our passage in verse 22, uh, Acts 2 verse 22, what does Peter say about the work of Jesus? He uses the exact same words to describe Jesus's works as those which are used in Joel's prophecy, right? Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders, and signs that God did through him in your midst. It makes sense. In other words, what I'm arguing is that Jesus' signs are these signs of the last day, at least part of them. And it makes sense that these would be signs of the last day. They're like the signs in Joel's prophecy, which point to both judgment for the wicked and the restoration of God's people, right? Like Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, the fact that he's casting out demons means that the kingdom of God has come. Judgment on the wicked, but restoration for the people of God. All of his works during his earthly ministry, his death, his resurrection, these are all signs and wonders that God gave that the last days have come. The Spirit as well came with signs at Pentecost, as we talked about, right? Signs of judgment, signs of restoration. The Spirit came with rushing wind, right? Symbolizing the Spirit's uh, presence breathing new creation life, right? Like God breathing into Adam so that he became a living being. This is the Spirit breathing new creation life into God's people. He came with tongues of fire over the disciples, right? This is like God's holy presence coming on Sinai with fire, right? This is like God's presence descending on the tabernacle, on the temple in fire. And now this holy presence, this presence of God comes upon each and every believer, not just a central place of God's presence dwelling in the midst of his people, but on each and every believer, actually, through the Holy Spirit. 
this special presence of God comes. The gospel is preached in various languages, right? This is the third sign that the Spirit comes with. Israel's restoration, one of the things that the prophets looked forward to that would happen during the last days was that all the nations would be gathered in, right? That's what this is symbolizing as well, that there's a gathering in of people from all nations. It's no longer just one language, but it's all the languages, all the peoples, all the nations who are being gathered in by the word and spirit of Christ. But these are also signs of judgment, aren't they? Because as the spirit brings new creation life through the preaching of the gospel, those who reject this message will be judged. God is a consuming fire. And, this, and uh, those who are clothed in Christ's righteousness, this will, uh, this will be a sanctifying kind of consuming fire. But for others, this will be a, an exterminating kind of consuming fire, as we talked about earlier, uh, earlier today. This, uh, this, these signs as signs of both restoration and judgment. So God has given these signs of both restoration and judgment through the ministry of Christ, through the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. It's clear that the last days have come, that the day of the Lord is imminent. That's what these things are bringing out. And we live in these last days, these days of restoration, these days of renewal, as the gospel goes forth in our world in the power of the Holy Spirit like it has never before. As the gospel is not restricted, God's people are not restricted to one land, worshiping at one temple in a centralized location, but God's presence is wherever his people are, right? Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, that's what God says. God's presence is where his people are. The tongues of fire descend on each and every person. His holy presence is with each and every one of his people. So the pouring out of the Spirit means that the last days have come. And this prophecy from Joel also talks about a more specific benefit which comes to God's people as a result of the Spirit's outpouring. And that is that the Spirit's outpouring also means that all God's people are prophets. This is what, uh, this is what Peter says, quoting Joel in verses 17 through 18. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. The background to this, uh, Joel, even in Joel's day, as he's prophesying about this happening, about all God's people becoming prophets, he's looking back to, uh, to an event that is recorded for us in Numbers chapter 11. As the people of Israel have left Sinai, right, they've been given the law, they've been given the instructions for the tabernacle, they're headed toward the promised land under the leadership of Moses. And of course, right, what happens almost immediately, they start to complain and grumble against Moses, right? They wish they were back in Egypt. They wish they had the kind of good food to eat that they had back in Egypt. Now they have only manna, right? They've so quickly forgotten that they were slaves in Egypt, that that was a terrible situation for them, that God redeemed them from that bondage. And they're basically asking Moses and grumbling that they want to go back into slavery. So everyone's complaining to Moses, and he feels very overwhelmed by uh, bearing the burden of this whole people by himself, right? And so, he, uh, and so he himself kind of complains to the Lord and says, I, I can't bear this burden um, <clears throat> all by myself. And so God appoints elders to help Moses to lead the people, and he says he's going to give some of uh, his spirit that's on Moses, he's going to give it to these elders so that they can lead the people. And this happens at the tent of meeting, right? God gives some of the spirit that's on Moses that empowers him to lead the people. He puts it on these elders that are going to help Moses lead the people. And the elders begin to prophesy. This is a, uh, this prophecy of the elders is, in other words, kind of authenticating that they've really received the spirit, right? They've really received the spirit and the proof of this is that they begin to prophesy. Now, two of these 70 who are appointed to lead Moses were not at the tent of meeting. They were still in the camp. They didn't come to the tent of meeting like they were supposed to, but they still receive the Spirit. They still begin prophesying in the camp. And Joshua comes to Moses and says, I'm concerned that they might be undermining your authority, that the people would no longer look to you, but they're going to look to these two other people instead. And what does Moses say in response to that? To Joshua, he says, are you jealous for my sake, 
Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Right? It's clear from this that the people in general did not have God's spirit in the way that Moses did. Right? This is how it worked in the Old Covenant. The emphasis in the Old Covenant is in the spirit dwelling in God's temple, is in the spirit empowering certain leaders of Israel like prophets and kings to do their mission that God had given them. But the Spirit is not given in this way to every person in Israel. And this is what Moses is looking forward to. This is what he's looking toward is a day, a time, when all God's people would receive God's Spirit in this special way, when all God's people would be prophets, would be empowered in this way. What is Moses really asking for here when he's asking, when he's expressing this desire that all God's people would be prophets, that God would give uh, his spirit to all God's people in the same way that he gave it to Moses? Is he asking that all of us would be able to tell the future and know what the winning lottery numbers are going to be or something like that? No. This isn't the point of prophecy, right? The prophets in the Old Testament are those anointed with the spirit of God to speak to God's people about the age to come, to speak to God's people about the last days, God revealed himself and his redemptive purposes to the prophets in a way that he didn't reveal it to everyone in Israel. And this is the problem that Moses is dealing with in Numbers 11, that the people have forgotten so quickly God's redemption, that they've forgotten so quickly what the Lord has done for them, so quickly his purpose for them in bringing them out of the land of Egypt to bring them into the promised land. Moses wants all God's people to have the spirit as he does, to grant them a greater understanding and insight into God's purposes so that they won't so easily turn away from God, so that they won't so easily forget the salvation that God has worked for them. And this desire from Moses is echoed throughout the prophets, not just in Joel, but in other prophets as well. This desire for greater spiritual understanding, greater communion with God, not only for the leaders of Israel, but for all of God's people in general. And a promise as well that this greater spiritual understanding, this greater communion will be a part of the last days, will be a part of the age to come for all of God's people. We find this in Ezekiel, we find this in Jeremiah, and we find this, of course, in Joel. This pouring out of God's Spirit on all his people, this making all his people prophets, granting all his people the communion and knowledge of God which only the leaders of Israel enjoyed under the Old Covenant. And this is what's fulfilled at Pentecost, Peter says. This is happening at Pentecost, right? We see this as disciples preach the gospel in languages that they've never learned before, right? This is kind of like the Spirit coming on the elders in Numbers 11. This is authenticating. They've really received the Spirit, right? This is proof, in other words, that they've really, the Spirit has been really poured out, that it's really indwelling God's people. And this Spirit dwells in you as well, this same spirit which was poured out at Pentecost. Because Joel's prophecy talks about all God's people, men and women, young and old, rich and poor, all of God's people. And so this is why, even in the case of John the Baptist, right, who is called the greatest of the old covenant prophets, who's someone we read was filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb, Jesus can say that the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. That's an incredible statement, really, if you think about it. The least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist because the least in the kingdom has received the Spirit in a way that John never did. The least in the kingdom has received a spirit from, the Spirit from our glorified Lord. And we've been granted greater and fuller understanding of God's redemptive plan than John ever was. This is the reason that we look at John and that question he addresses to Jesus. Remember, he sends a messenger to Jesus and says, are you really the one who's to come or should we look for another? And we look at that question and we think, that's so silly. How could you possibly doubt that Jesus is the one to come? And how could you possibly think we're to look for another? But it's because he hadn't received the Spirit in the way that we have. It's because Christ hadn't finished his redemptive work yet at that time. It's because he hadn't been given this greater and fuller and deeper understanding of God's work as God's people have been through the pouring out of the Spirit at Pentecost. And so the pouring out of the Spirit at Pentecost means that the last days have come and that all God's people are prophets 
And third and lastly, Joel's prophecy, which Peter quotes, tells us that the pouring out of the Spirit means that everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. This is the last piece of the fulfillment of this prophecy. This is the very last part of Joel's prophecy that Peter quotes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, if you look down at verses 22 and following, the verses after our passage that, were, uh, that we read a little earlier, maybe it's a little surprising to you, or may, maybe it's not surprising, but maybe it should be a little bit surprising to us that on this day that's all about the pouring out of the Spirit, that's all about the Holy Spirit, right? What does Peter talk about during his whole sermon? He talks about Jesus, doesn't he? He doesn't really, he quotes this passage from Joel, and then he gives a sermon about Jesus. This should probably surprise us a little bit. Why is this? Why not talk more about the Spirit in these verses? He begins in verses 22 and 23 by rebuking the Israelites, right? They crucified and killed a man who was clearly from God. Jesus demonstrated this by the signs and wonders and works that he performed. But God raised him from the dead, he says in verse 24, right? David prophesied that the Messiah would be resurrected in Psalm 16, and Jesus was indeed resurrected. So the resurrection of Jesus proves that he is the Messiah, the, the Christ that David looked forward to. And then in verses 33 to 35, Peter says, Jesus is now exalted and seated at the right hand of God. The Father has given him the Holy Spirit, and he's poured out the Spirit on his people. The fact that the Holy Spirit has been poured out is proof that Jesus is enthroned, that he is the Lord from Psalm 110. Right? The Lord, in other words, the Father said to my Lord, Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. This is the sermon that Peter gives, all about Jesus, right? All about Jesus' fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament, of Psalm 16, of Psalm 110. And Peter says, therefore, in verse 36, he's not only the Christ, he's also Lord. The Old Testament looks forward to a Messiah, right? A king anointed with the Holy Spirit like David, who will bring deliverance from, uh, for Israel from their enemies, but God also declares through the prophet several times that he himself would come to save his people, that God will save his people. And Jesus Christ is both. That's what Peter is saying here. He's Christ and he's Lord, right? He's the Messiah, the king anointed with the Holy Spirit without measure, and he's God come to save his people. He's both. And so Jesus Christ is the Lord upon whom we must call for salvation. He is the one Israel put to death their own Messiah, their own God. In verse 37, we read that many hearers were cut to the heart as a result of Peter's sermon. They were convicted of their sin in killing the Lord Jesus Christ. And now they ask another question, right? Peter's sermon began with a question. It was sparked by that question, what does this mean? And now it ends with a question too, what shall we do, they ask. And Peter's answer is repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter's sermon is about Christ through and through, isn't it? And maybe it should surprise us, maybe it does surprise us that on a day that's all about the Holy Spirit, Peter talks about Jesus so much in his sermon. This sermon that's a testimony to the person and work of Christ, but we must not forget that the Spirit throughout this whole sermon, is very much active. Active in exactly the way that Christ said he would be. Doing exactly what Christ said he would do. In John 15, as Christ is preparing his disciples for his departure, as he's preparing his disciples for his coming death, he also prepares them for the coming of the Spirit. He says, the Spirit will bear witness about me. In John 16, he says, The Spirit will convict the world or prove the world guilty concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And this is exactly what the Spirit was doing as Peter preached this Christ-centered sermon, wasn't he? He was bearing witness to Christ in the hearts of those present. He was convicting them of their sin and crucifying the Lord of glory. He was witnessing to Christ's vindication in his resurrection. He was convicting them of the coming judgment. Peter says, save yourselves from this crooked generation. There's judgment coming. This is ultimately why Peter's sermon is about the person and work of Christ, why his sermon is 
so Christ-centered through and through because it's through the gospel of Jesus Christ and the powerful working of the Holy Spirit that salvation comes, that the Spirit brings sinners from death to life. It's through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ pictures this work of the Spirit in bringing new creation life through the word of Christ in John 7, where he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Christ was talking about the Spirit here, the Spirit who makes the gospel effective and fruitful. One commentator put it this way, The Spirit is a never-failing source of gifts for those who believe in Jesus. This is the same thing that our catechism says, isn't it? The Spirit gives gifts from Christ. This is why 3,000 were added to the church that day. That's what we read. That's the result of Peter's sermon, right? 3,000 people were added to the church that day because the Spirit was making Peter's sermon, Peter's preaching about Christ, effective and fruitful on that day. So as we close then, thinking about this, our consideration of this uh, passage, this passage, this prophecy from Joel that Peter quotes makes clear that in the last days, in these last days in which we live, the Spirit is working as he never has before, that he's bringing the powers of the new creation into this world already, into this present age through the word about Christ, through the preaching about Christ, that he's bringing us to greater knowledge and communion with God than our old covenant forefathers ever enjoyed. These last days are days of restoration, days of blessing as the gospel goes forth to all nations. But these are also days of responsibility as the day of the Lord is imminent. Days of blessing for the righteous, but days of terror for the wicked. Peter tells us that there is a name upon which we can call to be counted among the righteous and saved in that day. And this is the name of Jesus Christ because he has already undergone the day of the Lord on our behalf. As darkness fell upon the land, as Christ hung on the cross, as blood flowed from his pierced side, as he drank the cup of God's wrath, Christ underwent the judgment of the last day for you and for me, for all who put their faith in him. These last days are days of God's forbearance as the gospel of Jesus Christ continues to go forth. And every time it does, God continues to grant an opportunity for repentance. If you are here today not calling upon the name of Jesus Christ for salvation, I urge you to repent and trust in Jesus Christ, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Today is the day of salvation. Repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation. For all of you who do trust in Christ, know that he has undergone that punishment on your behalf, that you have the Holy Spirit in a way that our old covenant forefathers never did, that you've been given insight and understanding in ways that they never have to God's redemptive purposes through Jesus Christ. So rejoice and be glad for that great blessing which he has given, and let us gratefully obey God's law as those who have received the Holy Spirit, as those who are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for your love in sending us your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who has accomplished our salvation we thank you that you have exalted and glorified him and that he has poured out his spirit on the church. Thank you for the work of the spirit, proving the world guilty of sin and righteousness and judgment, giving all your people a greater knowledge and communion with you and bringing new creation life into this present age through the gospel of Jesus Christ and the sacraments which you have given us. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ and in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen.